just I'll, I'll introduce. Okay. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to you all friends, all Horaces. A warm welcome to the Horaces India meeting. Introduced 13 years ago, the Horaces India meeting has become the foremost annual gathering of Indian business leaders and their global counterparts. I am Metin Said Givener, founder chairman of the Salon, a forward-thinking and pioneering platform developing innovative collaborations with academic, cultural, entrepreneurial, and philanthropic partners focusing on lives. I hope most of us have had the opportunity to enjoy the various plenary and parallel discussions which took part before our session. On restoring economic growth and more importantly, our esteemed leadership of panelists and audience to share in our discussion uh, together. I believe we are synchronized to meet one another, to bring out the best in each other through the toolbox in the making. I also believe reflection brings realization and may bring transformation if we have the right tools in our toolbox. Let us enrich our tools all together during this valuable time. Before we hear our panel's individual perspectives, I would like to highlight a few comments on collectively draw on our topic today. The World Bank recently in June 21 has projected the Indian economy to grow at 8.3% for the financial year 21 to 22. The strong growth rate in India is anticipated to, despite the climbing, crippling impact of the second wave of COVID-19. The World Bank said economic activity in India would benefit from policy support, including higher spending on the infrastructure, rural development and health, and higher than expected improvements on in-services and manufacturing. Restating our panel's stimulus for discussion, with the unprecedented COVID shock, India's budget is going to be under stress in years to come, creating difficult environments for the economic growth. How to minimize the social and economic costs of pandemic? What are the policy options for returning to buoyant growth? Which economic development model will prevail? Our panel today brings together individuals who have been nourished and grown in different environments, yet have emerged onto the same platform today to reflect on this profound topic. Conscious of the time allocated 45 minutes, <laughs> without further delay, may I kindly ask the panelists to raise your hand when your name is being mentioned for our audience to familiarize uh, each one of you. I'm delighted to invite the please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists onto the virtual stage to share their heartfelt stories, experiences, expertise, and opinions regarding the subject in discussion. Rajiv Lal, Chairman of IDFC Bank. Thank you. Welcome. Rajiv Raj Are, Founding Partner, Investment Committee Member, Convergence Partners, Switzerland. Good morning, Raj. Welcome. Good morning. Mahesh Kotecha, President, Structured Credit International Corp. Ashish Chaucharia, Partner, Advisory Head, Restructuring Services, Grand Toronto. Good morning. Nicholas Johnson, Founder and CEO, Economist Without Borders. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, over to our first round of discussions, I invite each panelist to take four minutes to share and expand on your personal experience with respect to the discussion of the day, while taking the opportunity to introduce yourself in the process. It will be also interesting to hear your impression of the disruption that COVID has caused our personal and wider communities and the lasting effects that you think will resonate from this. Rajiv Lal, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mitin. Um, I must uh, start with a correction to your introduction. I'm uh, Just to clarify, I'm no longer chairman of IDFC Bank, um, but I continue to chair uh, something called IDFC Institute, which is a think tank that um, I helped create um, more than a decade ago. I'm currently associated with the Singapore Management University, where I'm helping the university um, launch uh, and build up um, a newly set up center for green finance, the Singapore Center for Green Finance. 
So um, to your point, I think um, the pandemic certainly has given all of us um, a lot of food for thought and reflection. And I suspect like uh, a lot of people on this panel, um, um, I personally have not gone unscathed uh, by the pandemic. And it was indeed very uh, disturbing um, and settling to experience the collapse of our healthcare system um, and find that we couldn't really come to the aid of our loved ones, some of whom we lost. And to me, um, um, it really, the whole uh, devastation caused by the second wave of the pandemic in India, um, uh, prioritize two major issues, fundamental issues, that I think are vital as we contemplate the future um, of our country. And they are basically resetting the relationship between the public and the private sector. That's one. And the second one is resetting um, the relationship between the center and the states. These are two fundamental axes that we need to focus on. On the public and private, um, you know, for the last 20, 30 years, actually ever since the economic reforms of the 1990s, we have been very ambivalent about the relationship between the state and the private sector of India. Um, there are those who still believe that the public sector should retain the commanding heights of the economy. And there are those who think that the public sector is good for nothing and everything should be privatized. Um, I think what the pandemic has shown is that neither of those two uh, perspectives is correct. Um, we need to find a constructive engagement between public and private. A fundamental problem that we must address is the declining trust between government um, and the uh, 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 private sector. Were it not for that lack of trust, we would have not lost valuable time in developing vaccine manufacturing capability capacity in India. Were it not for that lack of trust between center and state, we would have had much more effective vaccine distribution and application done in a much shorter period of time. Um, so uh, I, I'm mindful of the time. Um, all this leads me to thinking that one fundamental way in which to address this decline of trust between public and private, center and state, is to focus our attention on building and strengthening the capacity of the Indian state. Uh, what do I mean by capacity? Well, uh, building the reg regulatory capability, the tax administration capability, the ju judicial capability of the Indian state would go a long way towards improving the trust relationship between the public and the private sector. Helping the state develop transparent procurement capability, project management expertise, contract management expertise would help the state outsource activities that are better done by the private sector. Building pure administrative capacity would help the Indian state develop a new age industrial policy that I think is vital given the new geopolitics of economic development as we contemplate the next couple of decades. The same can be said for the state governments, um, whether it is management of our cities, whether it is the delivery of last mile health care, whether it is the delivery of primary education, whether it is the management of agricultural marketing policies. A lot of these have to be handled by state level um, administrative authorities that are severely lacking in capability and capacity. Building that um, and having the central government engage constructively in helping the states build that capacity would go a long way towards dealing with the trust deficit. Um, so dealing with these two uh, twin trust deficits is my solution for the future. I will stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Rajiv. I believe that <coughs> pioneering uh, private-public partnerships, there's room there, and we'll expand on this. Uh, Raj, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here and meet you all. Um, so, you know, I, I really like uh, what, you, what you've said. It's my background is in healthcare. This has been a healthcare crisis. Um, I've lived with um, working in the pharmaceutical industry for over 30 years, uh, dealing with innovation around the world uh, for the last uh, 10 years. And I think this crisis has taught me one thing, and that is our ability to find solutions, to innovate, and you know, to navigate ourselves through a very difficult situation. I know a lot of people have been hurt, and uh, certainly, you know, globally the economy has been uh, uh, badly hit. But I, I firmly believe that the rejigging that's going to take place in the coming years will be uh, substantially better for, for all of us. And I think there's a lot of hope in what has happened um, in terms of how we've come together to solve, uh, solve this crisis. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I see in India, and it's always impressed me how a country as large as India with you know, 1.3 billion people, bigger than Europe, you know, how it can react to a crisis like this. And um, you know, globally, I think we should be very proud that they are able to react uh, in such a way. However, to continue a, a very sort of structured approach is very difficult over a long period of time in a country of this size. So many individuals, so many different viewpoints and different dynamics throughout the country. So, and I saw this in Europe. I mean, you know, as I live in uh, Spain, I could see how the different countries in Europe were approaching the problem. Uh, although we have the EU trying to tell us what to do, however, centrally, you know, they try to coordinate. However, it's a very much individual approach that each state or country took, and, uh, and that, you know, and you know, seeing the same thing happen globally, is, uh, you know, is, is uh, yeah, uh, is, is very evident. Uh, one of the things, you know, I deal, I dealt a fair bit with India during the COVID crisis, the beginning of the COVID crisis, working with one or two of the pharma companies, helping them in uh, various uh, projects. And, you know, it is one of the biggest hindrances is the red tape, right? Uh, the public institutions need a tremendous reform to work faster in identifying these are the solutions we want to go for and this is how we will execute. And, you know, that red tape needs to be uh, handled uh, and reduced. You know, it could be more efficient in the future. I think there will be a lot less pain. Thank you very much. Thank you for the insightful conversation there. And Mahesh, uh, Thank you very much, Metin, uh, uh, and uh, I appreciate very much Rajiv Lal's opening comments and Raj's uh, follow-on. Uh, I'm based in New York, and I'm born in Africa, in Uganda, so I'm an export uh, from India and a re-export with value added. Um, um, I was exported uh, first through lack of opportunity in India, which continues to be an issue because my father couldn't get education, uh, didn't have the money for it, as a, he wanted to be a lawyer. And I was re-exported by, uh, by President Idi Amin, uh, who didn't want me back, and didn't want the Indians who came from East Africa, from uh, India to East Africa back. So I take a global perspective looking back at India, and it's a great thing to be able to look back uh, at my roots and ask myself, what has happened and what can I contribute? I would like to pick up where uh, uh, you started and others have followed in terms of the pandemic's effect. Uh, the most important significant effect to me uh, in India is a reduction in the growth trajectory uh, wrought by the pandemic. 
it lowers on a secular basis the potential growth of India as a, as a whole. And the most important single thing to fix that, apart from the healthcare system to me, is a vast increase in infrastructure investment, which can elevate the growth rates substantially on a secular long-term basis with a great impact on the ability of the country to double its GDP per capita. Um, I have experience in the issues that Rajiv mentioned of public-private partnerships, and I'd like to note that the Indian infrastructure pipeline today is of the order of $1.4 trillion. Uh, the bulk of that is the government allocation of the, uh, the funding for the 2019-2025 national infrastructure pipeline. The private sector will need to fund another trillion dollars, bring it up to between 2.5 to $3 trillion, but the private sector's contribution for reasons that Rajiv has underlined and Rajiv has elaborated on further, uh, red tape and the like, uh, the private sector's contribution to funding of infrastructure has actually declined. Uh, it is uh, standing at around 20% and it should rise to 40%. The question is how? How can India do that? It has issues of public-private partnerships uh, and I think the most effective way to, to, to increase the investment is to bring in private sector with the trust uh, deficit addressed, with the red tape addressed, and with institutional arrangements improved so as to attract private sector into this uh, risky area. India has long attempted institutional innovations to facilitate private infrastructure investment, but they've had a mixed record. They've had debt funds, alternative investment funds, REITs, infrastructure investment trust, and specialized infrastructure lenders, and Rajiv can tell you more than I can about it. But banks still dominate private lending and investment, and that must change. Uh, Indian Infrastructure Development Finance Corporation was set up in the mid-90s uh, as a public-private partnership, but uh, uh, decided uh, 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 IDFC decided to become a bank in 2015 for whatever reasons uh, that Rajiv can explain better. Uh, but it may have had to do with funding uh, that is cheaper if you have a deposit-taking bank than if you are borrowing from banks. Um, IDFC's business plan envisioned uh, in 1990s something that I wrote, uh, which was to establish a guarantee company uh, uh, to, to guarantee infrastructure projects, much like municipal bonds are guaranteed in India, where the monolines have for 50 years guaranteed uh, trillions of dollars, literally trillions of US dollars of municipal and other infrastructure debt with not a default, not one default in the municipal sector, not one. Okay, they screwed up in the structured finance sector, which I was also involved in, uh, as a pioneer of the market. Uh, the, uh, the, the long dormant concept of financial, I almost set up such a company, a guarantee company in India in the 90s, where the Asian financial crisis intervened and I moved on. Such a financial guarantee company was contemplated uh, about five years ago under an, uh, a crystal report for the uh, ADB and the Ministry of Finance. And indeed, the government asked Indian Infrastructure uh, Finance Company Limited about three years ago to establish a monoline style infrastructure guarantee company called National Infrastructure Credit Enhancement uh, or NISE, NICE, which would have been nice to set up. But the thing has been uh, stillborn so far. Uh, while interest remains, it has not taken off. In the meantime, the Indian government has decided to set up a national uh, bank for financing of infrastructure development, and that is fine. It may be set up by the end of the year, but there's still a need to have a guarantee company to attract private sector investment by reducing and mitigating risks. And I will stop there because I know my time is probably running out. Ashish, thank you very much for your kind awareness and very uh, expert inputs here. Ashish, the uh, floor is yours and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, man. It's a pleasure to be here speaking at this conference with this esteemed panel. So my my comments uh, come from a slightly different uh, sort of perspective. A uh, lot has been spoken about infrastructure and pharma and healthcare. Uh, I think, you know, uh, India has done really well in the last five years addressing some of the, you know, the banking crisis that we're staring, you know, from 2012 to 2015. Uh, you know, how we have addressed that with this you know, huge reform, the, the insolvency code. Essentially, you know, there's been recently a lot of criticism around that, uh, you know, in, the, in the, the media about the effectiveness and the purpose of the insolvency regime. But look at, look at what uh, it has been able to achieve. And uh, today, I think, you know, our banks 
have by and large you know addressed the problem they are you know their in net and pays positions are very much at acceptable levels but i'm afraid this pandemic is something which is going to probably lead to a more serious consequence in the coming years and we are seeing the stress now in the retail segment as well for obvious reasons so many you know unemployment so much happening but i think you know the purpose of the insolvency code uh, the ibc as it's called well it colloquially it's also referred to as nclt for some reason but you know amount of shelf space that it carries like you know, in nclt unfortunately so some of the issues need to be addressed but look at the purpose you know reallocating you know the valuable economic resources to the right hands and thereby to reinvigorate business to generate employment i think you know a lot of steps have been taken in the right direction and because of what's happened in the in the uh, sort of nclt space the the uh, authorities the regulators reg- recognize that and they're moving towards a pre pack regime recently earlier in this year you know a pre pack regime was uh, introduced and this time you know we are starting we are starting small you know it's starting with the msmes to learn from that experience if you if some of you may will recall that you know back in 2016 17 when the ipc started they decided to put the top 12 companies you know the 30 dozen as they were referred to and that was almost 25% of the whole problem uh, or the entire npa problem was taken to ipc without any experience without any learning but i i believe that now you know uh, the step it's a step in the right direction learn from the smaller cases and apply you know into the bigger uh, sort of the, you know, as as we the, because that's sort how it happens like insured insolvency regimes uh, you know like uk uh, you know a lot of the deals happen through pre banks and that's sometimes a more efficient way to do it i mean uh, some of the cases do not have a solution through the insolvency court is you know you cannot bankrupt a company a case in example you know uh, where there has been a lot of criticism about value you know is is for example you know service companies like uh, jd airways you know it's uh, you know a case where i have personally been involved in and uh, you know the allocation you know how once the airline is grounded how difficult it is to to take it back up you know the challenges are being seen now i think the other uh, you know step in the right direction is uh, the the bad bank you know uh, there have been a lot of experiences around the world which india can learn from uh, you know that we really set up narc uh, it's though it's not a novel concept i mean something which india had arcs uh, for a while but i think if we do it right you know there's a lot of foreign capital which is waiting to come to india india will need this capital private capital is important because you know our banks 75% of our lending or 70 to 75% of our lending is through public sector lending and we know that we have a resource constraint in india so to attract capital from overseas that's extremely important i think that's a step in the right direction mm-hmm. and i think uh, last comment from me is you know uh, given the crisis the sectors which have been most impacted uh, you know the high touch point sectors like you know the hotel tourism uh, aviation sector what can the government do to address some of these you know the problems that they continue to face i think there's some very simple solution that is simple to my mind you know improve some tax offs for uh, you know people to travel within india you know like the lta we used to have the lta allowances give some soft for two years or you know where people will spend money you know and it is ultimately the government still gains from the indirect taxes so i think these sectors need support and uh, government can help and i think that's uh, probably the way to go but overall i think you know uh, we have uh, a challenge uh, coming up in the next 2 uh, 3 years the k shaped revival is not uh, ideal because the msmes you know generate a lot of employment in india we need to keep them alive that's all for my thank you very much i think we'll expand from there and uh, we will now move with nicolas to have your perspectives then we will go to the second round after that thank you Thanks very much. Um, so I'm, I'm an economist, and so I approach um, this discussion from from that perspective. Um, and you know, I've been watching the Indian economy very closely over the last, you know, five, six, eight, ten years, and um, I've noticed uh, three things. 
Um, but I want to preface that discussion with an observation that I think over the long term, over the next 20 or 30 years, India is in a very enviable position um, in the world because it does not have a de- the demographic problems that a lot of other major economies have. They don't have the aging population. In fact, India is, to my knowledge, the only major economy outside of the African continent that does not have that demographic aging population problem. And so therefore, there is an enormous latent potential in India to sustain a long-term growth trajectory. So what needs to happen to get India back on track after the pandemic to achieve that trajectory? Well, I think um, I echo, first of all, the comments by Mahesh, that we need to have more targeted infrastructure investment in India. Um, This is, you know, absolutely essential to build the infrastructure and create the jobs and sustain that growth. Um, The second thing is that that needs to be done in combination with a strategy to manage inflation. Because in India, we have, you know, a relatively high um, inflation. It's around around 6% at the moment, and that's right at the upper end of the the central bank's sort of 2 to 6% target. And if we're going to be, you know, employing a lot of um, targeted infrastructure investment, the risk is that that will create demand pull inflation, which will which will run away. So, targeted infrastructure investment needs to be combined with a strategy to make India a um, a really really um, well known destination for, for for the international labour market. And you know, basically, India needs to work out a way to inspire young people from around the world to go, hey. I want to move to India because they have the best jobs, there's the best opportunities, okay? And I don't, I don't think India is quite there yet. Um, this is reflected in India's um, slightly negative net migration rate. And we know that there's enormous potential amongst um, young Indians, but a lot of them go overseas for education or they move to the, the United States or to Europe, and they do extraordinarily well. We see so many Indians at the top of the, top of the fields in technology and um, and banking around the world. What we, what it needs to do is work out a way to make its own education institutions um, more attractive, not only for their own talent, but for talent overseas and also the local job markets. You have more influx of workers. Now, what that will do is that will curb um, wage growth and inflation so that we don't have inflation run away as we um, you know, implement that targeted infrastructure spending. And um, uh, finally, I think... Um, to achieve that um, that attractiveness as a destination for young people, um, India needs to um, implement a strategy to um, get people going and going out and taking risks and moving again um, after the pandemic. Because um, in the long term, that's that's what's going to drive that growth. Thank you very much, Nicholas, and thank you all for sharing your expert perspectives. Uh, interpretations and valuable insights. On to our second round now, I would like to request each panelist to ask a question to one of your fellow panelists based on the discussion around your projections for the future with respect to how India's economy may rebound alongside its society. And please share and expand the response no longer, no longer than three minutes and we'll reverse the order that we started. Nicholas, we, we will start with you, please. So you ask the question who you choose to. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I've just got a question for, for Raj, um, because I agree with your sentiments that India needs to work out a way to cut red tape. Uh, what are your thoughts on the most effective way to go about that? And what areas do you think should be prioritized? Well, you know, your summary earlier uh, was spot on in terms of the potential and so forth. But, you know, having migrated back to India, then out of India, I I see a lot of my colleagues who are talent, which came back, try to run companies, go back quite despondent, right? You know, the, it, I, I, I guess I'm classed as an NRI and I, you know, Amongst a lot of NRIs, we're thought of as not required Indians, right? Which is, <laughs> which is wrong. <laughs> which is wrong because I do a lot of work with China, right? Um, you know, I, I sit on the review board of the uh, largest uh, healthcare uh, ecosystem in the world, which is EIT Health, European uh, Public Private Partnership. And we try to support companies going to different uh, large markets. Now, you know, what I see very clearly is 
that when I give the choice to some of the uh, some of the uh, growth stage companies with great innovation, where do you want to go? Obviously, the U.S. is attractive. China is the second largest healthcare market. And I ask the question: What about India? Right? You know, immediately the question is: How you know, how easy is it to do business there? Mm. Yeah, and we know the ratings. India is increasingly difficult to do business. It hasn't really improved, right? In China, they have systems. They have a very structured process. There are a lot of turtles that have come back and set up organizations to facilitate very smoothly how to get government funding as well as you know VC funding, well as corporate funding, and everybody is very structured in the way that they. Try to attract. Now we have a mandate from Tsinghua University, right? Which was, uh, which is the MIT of China. Three years ago, it was uh, number one in the world. To identify innovation in Europe, which would be useful for the Chinese market, right? So they can collaborate, build JVs, and so forth. And they fund it. They fund it. Now. If the government was able to replicate some of those good practices, right, like the NIH does in, in, in the U.S., uh, various bodies in Europe, I can you know, name, and they're doing similar things in, in China, um, it would encourage a lot of talent, which is outside India, to set up uh, organizations and uh, companies there. And then, you know, one of the key things also is, you know, our education system in India, you know, we talk about the number of universities and number of people coming out of the education system. The quality of graduates I saw coming out of India, um, I have to say is very poor, right? They are good at articulation intellectual masturbation, but no real practical skills, right? What Germany does well is build people who are very practical in, and are able to execute, yeah? Um, so you know, I think, you know, encouraging education institutions to look at the models they have in successful universities, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, you name it. There. Uh, I work with uh, the innovation hubs all around Europe, and one thing is very clear, the universities which are generating innovation have corporates next to them, Philips, Siemens, you name it, and they have very structured programs to give the students, you know, apprenticeships, practical skills on how to sort of use their knowledge, and they come out uh, much more actually. Thanks very much. I'm going to be practical, as you suggested on this one, because we owe the time. So, next uh, panelist, uh, please. So, uh, may I may I come in, mate? Sure, so please. I have a question for Mr. Kotecha. Uh, so, since you have been involved uh, a lot in the you know, infrastructure space, as you mentioned, uh, can you tell me uh, what your views are on the uh, role of development financial uh, institutions vis-a-vis -vis banks in the you know in the infrastructure growth of the country, and why in India you know, did we see that you know a lot of these development finance institutions have just transformed into you know banks or you know, they've chosen to go the you know uh, the, the, the the bank way, whereas what required in infrastructure is a you know, patient long term capital. So, uh, can, any thoughts on that? Why are we not seeing more of that? Because that's what India needs, right? Well, uh, uh, much of my experience, thank you very much for that question, Ashish, is in in, in risk. Uh, I spent a decade uh, at uh, Standard & Poor's rating countries and companies owned by countries and banks around the world, uh, all non-U.S. And I was uh, also a pioneer in the structured finance markets where I came up with a CDO at Peter Peabody, uh, the first public CDO. So I know structured finance and, uh, and uh, public, and, and let's say credit risk very well. The problem I see in, in this issue of uh, financing 
uh, uh, the tap dance between the private and the public sector in infrastructure financing has to do with risk. Uh, there is a lot of risk in, in infrastructure because projects are long term. They require a lot of regulatory oversight and interference occurs that reduces or eliminates or or enhances returns for private sector investors. And there's a lot of red tape that goes along with it, including transparency issues, uh, procurement issues, as Raji mentioned. So uh, I think what is needed is, is a, a framework for managing the risks and reducing them over time in a way that is institutionally embedded uh, so as to accelerate the process of uh, uh, identification of risks and allocation of those risks to those who are able to bear them and are willing to do so. Uh, banks are typically medium-term lenders. They don't have capacity to go long-term. Infrastructure financing is typically long-term. You need to bring in institutional investors. For them to bear that risk, somebody has to reduce it to the extent that it is possible and to the extent that it is acceptable to them. And that's what financial guarantee industry in the U.S., which was invented in 1972, and is guaranteed three trillion dollars of debt three trillion okay um, much of it in public finance uh, some of it in as a structured finance a trillion is structured two trillion in the other sector with in the other sector in the two trillion part of it without a default in the one one trillion there were defaults in the CDO territory so that is an industry that the Indians tried to set up I try to set up and I think if it was if it was set up it would allow capital market access, which is long-term patient money, low-cost money, to come in in huge amounts, as it has in the U.S. And it would uh, it would allow India to progress. It always fails on uh, two or three things. One, regulation. RBA gets in, RBI gets in uh, and and makes rules that make it difficult for Nice to operate. Nice is actually stuck on the issue of regulation of of their capital. Uh, they are to apply monoline capital standards, which are driven by ratings, not by regulatory bank regulatory considerations. A second is internal bickering among different parts of the ministries of finance. The uh, NICE was a DEA child, Department of Economic Affairs. NAFID, the new DFI, is a DFS child. And the two are in competition, in effect. And I hope that the competition is such as they set up both, because both are needed. Um, and the private sector is to nudge it along. I think the conclusion of some of the investors was that the economics of the NICE were not effective. That's because they failed to attract international expertise, such as people like me and others have, where we know how to make money as a private sector financial gain talk. They ignore it. I went to them millions of times. They just ignore you. So there is essentially inability to get to this long jam of risk and the allocation of Thank risk. you, Mahesh. Thanks very much for just rounding that up. And who is next, please? Mahesh, uh, would you like to ask a question? To uh, yes, I think, Rajiv, uh, I would say, uh, would, you, would you please correct me? Because I, I, I hope that from sitting in New York, what I've gleaned, I hope, is accurate. If it's not accurate, I'd like you to set the record. Uh, and tell me that I'm wrong about about the potential for financial guarantees in India and that it's just the wrong product for the wrong market. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but I think that it could make a huge difference. And uh, your experience is really valuable because you went from an IDFC, which was for infrastructure, to a bank, and now you are in a position where you can uh, tell us about, uh, share us share with us your wisdom. So I, I uh, thanks for that question, Mahesh. Um, um, you know, uh, there are a number of institutional pieces that need to come together um, to make infrastructure finance happen the way we all want it to happen. Um, the, the new development finance company that is being created, um, and I've written about it in, in media and in, in the press, um, uh, should really learn from the experience of um, IDFC for one. Um, and one of the important lessons from the IDFC experience was that this development finance institution must not be a listed entity, must not be listed on capital markets. Mm. Because if it is, then th that's one of the reasons that we had to convert IDFC into a bank, mm. right? Um, the, the logic of a market um, uh, is irresistible as a listed, listed entity. And you have to go with a business model that over long term makes more money. 
Um, whereas a development finance institution, by definition, is a, a quasi-public good and should not be subject to that kind of market pressure. There are other ways of raising capital um, for a development finance institution. It doesn't have to rely entirely on government money, uh, but it could go um, through um, you know, a private equity kind of structure rather than a listed structure. On the uh, guarantee company, um, you know, the, the risk that you are trying to um, uh, mitigate um, are almost entirely um, uh, best dealt with by government itself. So if you look at um, the highest risk are in the greenfield phase of infrastructure development. And there, the unpredictability of the land acquisition process, um, getting all the regulatory approvals in time, um, uh, were two very significant um, factors beyond the control of market participants um, that government is best able to address. So, um, you know, so if some kind of credit enhancement has to be given, in my view, it has to be given with uh, government participation mm -hmm. because this is a risk that only government can mitigate. But like you, I found that government was very unwilling to accept that some of its behavior might be risky from the point of view of market yeah. participants mm -hmm. and therefore was very reluctant provide credit enhancement for its own behavior. Raju, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we got about three minutes left uh, for this <laughs> and I had uh, other ideas. So I would suggest that um, we really, I will really value the idea <laughs> of uh, mentorship in our lives. And I also really would love to get the audience to hear what book touched you in your life and what book would you write? But we really have little time. I'm sorry that we are not going to ask the other questions because uh, I, I think this subject is important for people to take away with. And uh, would you just start? A anyone can start to say, what is the mentorship? And then um, maybe we carry on with you, right? What's the mentorship meaning? And what book uh, would you write? And what is the book that touched you? And we just go very quickly. Well, mentorship is uh, very important. I, don't, I think that especially in a hyper-competitive world, um, uh, you need all the help you can get. And so finding people with experience that take an interest in you as an individual get ahead is like support. I have benefited greatly from very wise mentors in the past um, in different stages of my career, from academia to what business. Book? What book? The book you want that I want to write or the what the book that I, I want to touch you that people can read. Well, I would, uh, I've really been uh, impressed with and influenced by uh, Yuval Harari's Sapiens. Very, very troubling and thought provoking. Thank you. Sorry about the time, we're gonna move on. Next, whoever would like to go first. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I, I okay. think very my, quick. My, my, uh, my mentor was my high school neighbor and teacher, Mrs. Santosh Rai. She was from Punjab. She taught me to love reading. And that has carried me uh, where I am today. Second, a book uh, that I read that I loved was Mahatma Gandhi's Satyana Prayogo. He's, this is a book about freedom for India and the method he devised <coughs> of civil disobedience. It didn't influence me, but it, it was a great book. Thanks, Mahesh. Next. Yeah, I'll go. Um, mentorship to me is a way which we can um, create communal knowledge. And I think it's really important that we emphasize that in, in a world um, which can be increasingly disconnected. Um, a book which really inspired me was Zero to One by Peter Thiel. And um, I wrote a book uh, which came out last year on the economics of the fourth industrial revolution. And if you check the comments, I've just put the um, Amazon link if you want to check it out. Thank you very much. That's next. Well, for me, uh, you know, I I just recently lost my mentor, and um, I lost him premature. And for him, the three or two or three learnings that I carry with me is uh, dream big and dream every day. Uh, always go against the tide, 
and truth will prevail. I think that's the three sort of key messages from him. In terms of a book which kind of left an impact on me was uh, Life Without Limits by uh, Nick Vujic. I think that's a, that's a book that is kind of inspiring to me. So, yeah. Thank you. So, you know, I, I'm also an executive coach and um, I set up the for the EU the mentoring uh, system throughout the EU. And one thing I learned uh, while doing this is that there is a lot of technology available and uh, that should facilitate better choice to identify good mentors. Having the tools to you know, find good people like yourselves to uh, nurture talent should be in place. And uh, I've seen this system grow and grow and grow and it's uh, wonderful to see. I've had wonderful mentors throughout my career and uh, throughout my life journey and I wish everybody to identify a host of mentors for different aspects of their life. Uh, the, book, the book that I, um, I always remember, it's nothing to do with business, is uh, Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf, which uh, <laughs> I, I read when I was a teenager and it always stuck with me. <laughs> it's a great book. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate you, the panelists, our audience, the strategic partners, the organizers, co-organizers, and especially Dr. Frank in uniting global stakeholders for an unparalleled experience. I think it's important to reflect upon our individual and collective evolutionary journey. Start with our immediate family, growing with our friends and acquaintances, with our communities, countries, and continents. Let us evolve and grow as mentor to mentor, peer to peer, deal to deal, and reaching out to many by expanding, planting the seeds, cultivating the roots, and sharing the fruits. Continuing the Horace's tradition, and look forward to seeing you on the next panel. Enjoy your other sessions, enjoy your weekend, and thank you very much for joining and enlightening us all. Thank you. Have thank a great you very much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Go for it. Selfie, hi. <laughs> I think we did it. Nicolas, yeah, did I it? it? Uh, I think so. It's just I thinking. Know. It's still taking, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you might need to click the photo on your own screen. Ah. Okay. Uh, I am, but it's not uh, doing the trick. No. Your original session has a lot. It's not allowing us. It's not allowing us. Maybe not. You can do it. You can do it. You can always do a snip. I'm not so sure. It's telling me that it's finished now. So, okay. okay. Try. No. Three more. I was able to. I, I have I was, a snip. I, think I can. I can. You can do a snip. I, I did a snip. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Really nice to meet you. I'm sorry rushing it in the end, but then again, it's already Thank alerting us. Very great session. All the best. And we may, look may I, to may I, I think, Matthew, you were great. And I think it was a great conversation. I appreciated the questions and answers. And I think it was a terrific way to handle it. Thank you. Um, Thank congratulations. You. It was very insightful. I mean, you are all experts and amazing leaders, and thanks for the heartfelt conversations. That was very open. Rajiv, I would love, I, I would love to reconnect with you if you can send me your email address. Some, I think you did actually. So, They're all copy. so I, 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 did, I, I did. have it. So I, I will write yeah. to you some more about this. Please, um, yeah, please. Thanks. And I'd like to learn from you more about this government being unwilling no, to. Would love to. I'd love to learn about um, your views on the future of the IPC. No. I, I would love to talk to you about that. Uh, I mean, I think the, uh, Thanks, uh, as well, as well with Ashish. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.